We are people of the presence. I hope this series is helping you to know and experience the Spirit of God in deeper and new ways. The Spirit of God has come to dwell among us. We are the, we are the temple of the living God, corporately, individually. Here's what it says in Ephesians. It says, In Him the whole building, it's talking about the church, is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And then 1 Corinthians, it says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? The last few weeks we've been looking at this watershed moment in the history of the church when the Spirit of God is poured out on the day of Pentecost. And we've seen that this the Spirit infilling, this baptism in the Holy Spirit, it's not just for the Green Beret types of, of Christians, like the super elite, really holy type, whatever that means. But it is for sons and daughters. It is for men and women. It's for adults. It is for children. It is for every tongue, tribe, and nation. And last time, I ran out of time, but you, you may or may not remember, but I had we had gone through two points. And my first point was that the Holy Spirit is for everyone. And my second point was the Holy Spirit is for everyone. Can you guess what my third point is? It is not the Holy Spirit is for everyone. It is that the Holy Spirit gives us joyful fearlessness. The Holy Spirit gives us joyful fearlessness. Today we're shifting from the who of Pentecost to the why of Pentecost, or, or maybe the what of Pentecost. Like why, why was the Spirit poured out? What is the purpose of Pentecost in the outpouring of the Spirit? And I think one of the answers was to give us joyful fearlessness as we follow Jesus. Joyful fearlessness as we follow Jesus. And so when we are overflowing with God's Spirit, when the Spirit has been poured out in our lives, there will be a joyfulness and there will be a courage. And so a diagnostic question for us to get started is, am I following Jesus with joyful fearlessness? Like, is that how you would describe your life. That's really two questions in one. You've got the joyful part and the fearless part. And so for the, the first one, would, would those closest to you consider you a joyful Jesus follower? Your, your family, your co-workers, would they consider you a joyful Jesus follower? Like when you, when you leave the room, like are, are they relieved? Like because you've carried some, some anxiousness, some, some fear, some bitterness. Or, or when you leave the room, have people, are, they, are they left feeling encouraged? This is one way to maybe look at this question. Or maybe think of it like the character Pigpen from the, uh, from the, the Peanuts comics. Pigpen, he's, he's dirty. And when, when he leaves the room, there's, he leaves this cloud of, of dust. And, uh, but maybe, maybe it's not a cloud of dirt that follows you but a cloud of discouragement and anxiety. And it's hard for people to even catch their breath in your aftermath. Like they're, they're just waiting for you to leave so they can, like that, that is not a joyful presence. It could be uh, your anxiety around the upcoming election, which on one hand, is, it's understandable. Like there's a big decision facing our nation, but like are, are you just constantly overwhelmed with with checking the news feeds and the polls and who's up and who's down and just stressed and anxious about the upcoming election or when you leave the room do people feel refreshed because they've experienced that deep joy that you carry with you that's one of the marks of a spirit-filled life and and the second part of that is it would those closest to you describe you as fearless or as courageous as you follow Christ. So we're spending one more day in Acts chapter 2, and I just want to do a quick recap of 50 days in the history of the church, right up to, to Jesus' death. So you can look here at this diagram. Jesus, he dies, he's buried. It's not on this chart. You might remember that when Jesus dies, that his disciples, they are cowering in fear. They are hiding themselves in, in rooms and locking the doors because they, they're afraid that what happened to Jesus is about to happen to them. Like if, 
if this is the way they treated Jesus, this is the way they're going to treat us. And so they hide in fear. When Jesus rises from the dead, he appears to the disciples over a period of 40 days. He gives them his final instructions. And the last thing he tells them is to wait for the gift from the Father, the Holy Spirit. And Jesus ascends to the right hand of the Father. And then there's 10 more days of waiting. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit finally comes. There's rushing wind and there's fire and they're speaking in tongues. And at some point, this prayer meeting in the upper room moves out into the streets. Remember, this is Pentecost. It's a time of pilgrimage. And the text says that, that people hear them speaking in their languages. So at this point, they've left the room. They're out in the streets, probably close to the temple. And let me just read a couple verses from Acts chapter 2. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They had had too much wine. Too much wine. I mentioned that the Holy Spirit gives us joyful fearlessness. So you could say in one sense that being filled with the Holy Spirit is a little like being drunk. Just a little bit. A little like being drunk. Now don't, don't turn me off yet. I'm not, I'm not saying it's exactly like. Just a little bit like. Because the, the reason that, that people thought they were drunk is how they were acting. Right? They had a joyfulness about them. They were speaking the gospel without inhibition, just out there in the public. And so there was this joy and courage. And up to this point, Jesus' followers, they'd been timid, they'd been reserved, looking over their shoulders in fear. And like, well, when was the last time you were part of a worship service? And, and people were like, what are those people on and how can I get some? Right? What, what are these people on and how can I get some? I would love for us to display this kind of joy when we gather to worship. Like we have created an incredibly hospitable gathering in our micro churches uh, throughout the weeks in, in our homes when we gather at Hallett. And it is, uh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And, and what I see are people genuinely uh, curious about others, caring for one another. And on Sundays when we gather, there is no visitor left behind. Like there is this genuine Jesus filled, spirit-filled hospitality happening. I mean, just this month, we, we had a guest, and I'll follow up with our guests when they fill out the Connect card and see if they want to get connected with the micro church. And uh, repeatedly, and it happened this month, I'll reach out like, hey, you interested in micro church? And they're like, oh yeah, already been invited. I'm going to this one. I'm like, all right, perfect, perfect. That's exactly uh, what we want to happen. And what if what if we added to that hospitality just this deep joy that is maybe even a bit unusual? That makes people question, like, what, what's going on here? And I'm still reflecting on what our, our speaker last Sunday, uh, Sunday had to say about his experience, about being in prison and solitary confinement and beaten and poisoned, and in the midst of that, finding Jesus and having joy. Like, do you remember how he greeted us? He said, are you happy in Jesus? Are you happy in Jesus? I was like, man, what a, what a great question. But when we are filled with the Spirit, there is a deep, abiding joy that is available to us. And we, we don't have a, a lot of insight into how the disciples reacted during those 40 days when they spent time with Jesus. So remember our diagram. They, they were in fear they were cowering. Jesus shows up to them. And then there's like a 40-day period. And during those 40 days, like we're agnostic on to what their attitude was. What, are they still in hiding? Are they still afraid? But what we do know is how they acted after Pentecost. Like there was no more hiding. There was no more timidity after Pentecost. And we can say that for, for certain. They had a, a joy and a courage. And they were, they were too happy to care about what other people thought about. They were too happy to be afraid of, of anything. And when you see a, someone who lacks fear and is extremely happy, it, it can remind you right, of someone who is, is drunk because alcohol does that. We, we have a, a term for what alcohol does to the person. Right? It's called liquid 
Liquid what? Liquid courage. And I know you personally don't know what I'm talking about. You've seen it, right? You've seen this in somebody else's, like someone who's normally reserved, maybe quiet, they get a couple of drinks in them, and then, oh, oh inhibition is gone, they're the life of the party, Ava song comes on, and they're dancing queen, sweet 16, 17, 17. I don't know the words, besides dancing, uh, but like, just inhibition, it's gone, liquid courage, and they, they act in a way that they would never act if they were fully aware. And in that sense, being filled with the Spirit is like being drunk. We have this joyful fearlessness when we are filled, uh, especially when it relates to telling people about Jesus. Jesus had promised them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. And so we're, we're talking about the why of the Spirit. In front and center is empowerment to be witnesses, to declare the good news in our neighborhood and to the ends of the earth. And now the disciples, they have received the Spirit, and now they are proclaiming the mysteries of God. And I'm sure when, when it, you think about sharing your faith with others, we have, we've all experienced... Uh, timidity. We've all experienced fear, like how it's going to be received, and we don't know how to have the conversation. And, uh, and I, I, just, I wonder, like, when was the last time that you had a Jesus conversation with someone that you knew wasn't a Jesus follower? When was the last time? Like, when was the last time that you had that conversation? And I think a lot of times it's, it's fear. It's fear that holds us back. And Jesus says, you will receive power when my Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. And so there is this joyful fearlessness to share the hope of the gospel that the Spirit gives us. And that's what happens on the day of Pentecost. So we're going to read in verse 14 Peter's response to this accusation of being drunk. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd Fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. If you're familiar, familiar with this passage, the shock value has worn off. It's kind of like the, the first time that you see Empire Strikes Back, and you've got Darth Vader and Luke in the, the big reveal, and you're like, what just happened there? Uh, my eight-year-old daughter just watched it for the first time, and she's like, there's no way that could be his dad because dads would never cut off their kid's arm. I'm like, fair point, fair point. But, I'm sorry if that was a spoiler for you, but this, the second time, and the, or the third time you watch it, like there's not that shock value there because you, you know the story, and I think we know the story, and so we, we lose some of the shock value of remembering who Peter is and, and what he had just done because the, the Gospel of Acts is volume two of a two-volume work. It is a, a sequel. And in volume one, the Gospel of, of Luke, we, we have the story about Peter. And it, it's one of the low points of the Gospel when, at the moment, when Jesus needs someone the most, when he needs a friend, when he needs someone to be there for him, right, as he's being uh, arrested, and so I got ahead of myself. Um, but in case you don't know the story, but right before Jesus is arrested, he has one final meal with his disciples. And, and Peter tells Jesus, he, he commits to him, no matter what, I am ready to die for you. And Jesus is like, nah, bro. <laughs> no, you're not. In fact, you're going to deny that you know me three times tonight. Like before the sun comes up tomorrow, you're going to die. And Peter's like, no, nah, never going to happen. That's exactly what happens. And in the Gospel of Luke, uh, we, we have this in the other Gospels as well. But in the Gospel of Luke in particular, there's this moment where it says right after, so Luke 22, Peter replies. So someone has just asked him, don't you know him? And Peter replies, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times.
tears. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Imagine you read the Gospel of Luke first time. This is the last impression you have of Peter. You come to the Acts, the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, and all of a sudden, Peter is up proclaiming in a loud voice. This is less than two months later. Less than two months later, where prior, it, one servant girl was enough to send him running. Like, no, I don't know. And here there are thousands gathered. And Peter gets up and proclaims the gospel. And it says, he stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Like, this isn't the same person. After Pentecost, he is a changed man. He is a coward no longer. He is like the lion in Oz who has found his courage. And so he stands and proclaims the good news and he tells everyone that they must call on the name of the Lord to be saved. And he wraps it up with this. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. This man knows no fear, no more timidity, no more hiding behind locked doors, no hesitation. The Spirit of God has given him a joyful fearlessness, and he wants to do the same for us. And we have that same Spirit dwelling within us. But let's, again, like when we think about sharing our, our faith, it just, man, it it's can be a fearful thing. It can be a fearful thing. We're, we're worried about rejection or, or failure. But the Holy Spirit has come to break that fear and to put within us a desire to share the good news. So not just remove the fear, but then also to put within us a desire to share the hope of Jesus. And that, this doesn't mean we become obnoxious or insensitive, but we are motivated out of a genuine concern to share this hope that we have, and it just overflows out of our, our lives. And this is, uh, the series has been a reminder for me as well. Like, I'm trying to drink the medicine too. And uh, what I'm praying for you, I'm praying for me as well, living in the Spirit. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was leaving uh, Jubilee Coffee. It's on Colfax. Uh, in fact, uh, I would encourage you to, uh, to visit Jubilee Coffee. Drink their coffee, buy their coffee, buy their roasted coffee. They were recently bought by Jesus on Colfax, and so now it's uh, going to be part of, um, of that, that ministry. And so let's support uh, Jubilee Coffee. But I was, I was in the back, Laura we, and I were there. We had met with somebody, and so like there's an alleyway behind the, the, kind of the, the main entrance, and we were coming out into the alley, and a guy comes up. Um, with, with the daughter, he's like, hey, what is this place? Like, oh, it's a, it's a coffee shop. He's like, oh, cool. And we began uh, this conversation, asked him a couple questions, like, hey, tell him, you know. And he, I don't know if, if he doesn't talk to people very often, but he just was like, whoa. Don't, told me his whole life story. And he, Lord, and we were standing there as well. And uh, But he was recently, about a year ago, moved from Chicago and Growing up in Chicago, there was so much segregation, and where he grew up, he was always carrying uh, carrying a gun, and he had, um, he told me he had never talked to a white guy. And uh, I said, well, have you ever been hugged by a white guy? And so I, I proceeded, he said no, so I, I gave, him, gave him a hug, and he told more of a story about never having a, a legitimate job until moving to Denver. And he like points around East Colfax, it's like, man, this place is so great. People don't know how good they have it here. Now, if you know Denver, like East Colfax is a place that people typically avoid. And so I'm thinking as he's pointing around and it's like, man, where are you from in Chicago? Um, but it was not good where he was, where he was from. So he shares a story about moving with his daughter, trying to have a better life for her. And as we're getting ready to leave, I, I just asked him, I was like, hey man, can we, can we pray for you? And that, that's not... I wouldn't say like my normal M.O., though it's becoming more so. It's becoming just asking people, can I pray for you? Is there anything I can pray for you about? So right there in the alley, uh, we gathered and we prayed for him. And he, he had a little bit of knowledge of, of the gospel. And so I, I prayed uh, that there would be no more shame and that he would um, 
embrace who, who he is in, in Jesus in Jesus Christ and the forgiveness that we have. Um, that's just, just one example. And I, um, and I want that to become the norm, not just for me, but for all of us, for all of us to live with this joyful fearlessness. And I said, I said the Holy Spirit gives you this joyful fear, fearlessness a little bit like being drunk. But let me quickly say it's also not like being drunk. Not like being drunk. Because it's way different than actually being drunk. Because why are you happy? Not you, I mean you, like, as a euphemism. Why, why is someone happy when they're drunk? Because they're stupid. Right? They don't know what's happening in the world around them. Inhibition is gone. Reality is dimmed. And uh, the things that bother them when they're sober don't bother them when they're drunk. And so the, the broken relationship no longer exists. The failures fade away. Your, your unrealized dreams are forgotten. Your pending legal issue, poof, it's gone. It's like magic when you're drunk. Your fear of rejection or what people will think of you, gone. Reality is hidden. It is joy through stupidity. It is joy through stupidity. And it's not a lasting joy. It can't deliver what it promises. It is a temporary respite that will leave you worse off than when you started. I don't recommend. I don't recommend. The Holy Spirit, on the other hand, gives you joy through intelligence. The Holy Spirit gives you joy through intelligence. We get a deeper understanding of God's love for us through Christ when we are filled with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes real in our hearts what we know to be true in our heads and that the only opinion that matters is the one who made us, the one who saved us, the one who redeemed us, and he loves us unconditionally, that he has done everything for me. Though The Holy Spirit makes real to us the majesty and the power of God. The Holy Spirit makes us more aware of reality, not less aware of reality. He shows us who we are and what Christ has done for us. And the fear that was bothering us begins to shrink and it becomes small. I, I become more aware of my, my sin and my unworthiness and more aware of his grace and his love towards me in spite of my unworthiness. And I am washed, I am cleansed, I am justified, I am a child of God. Paul puts it this way, that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. The Spirit of God makes us more aware of reality. I realize that my identity is not tied to my performance or my prospects or to my failures and my heartbreaks. The Spirit of God gives us joy and fearlessness to proclaim the gospel because we know that we are children of God. So there, there is stupid happiness and there is intelligent happiness. And the Holy Spirit gives us intelligent happiness. And it leads to joyful courage. Joyful courage. So when, when we're filled with this, this joy, it just becomes natural to share it with others. And I mean, think about it. When you've experienced something um, that you've enjoyed, something that was meaningful to you, you share it with others. In fact, the experience becomes more meaningful the, the more you tell people about it. Right? Instead of just keeping it to yourselves, you want to let others know. It's the same with the gospel. When the Holy Spirit fills us with joy in, in knowing Jesus and, and who we are, we, we want to naturally share it with others. And the more you do, the less you'll care what people think. Because here, here's the truth. Those who are filled with the Spirit are so secure those who are filled with the Spirit are so secure in God's love that they are not driven by the approval of others. We know that we're already accepted by the King of the universe. We are already accepted, and so we can be fearless in sharing the gospel. Friends, the world desperately needs the good news of Jesus Christ. We have been given this gift. We have been filled with the Holy Spirit in order to make disciples of our neighbors of Denver to the ends of the earth. So let's, let's be people of joyful fearlessness, knowing that we are loved 
and accepted and empowered by the Spirit of God. Grace and peace.